Yes, Call to order work session, Goodyear City Council, Monday, uh, 30th August, 2010. All items listed are for discussion only. No action can and will be taken. All members of council are in attendance. We had five items on our agenda today. We're just postponed the one on arts and culture, so we'll move immediately to um, Harry Paxton and the Westmark Regional Advocacy Program. Thank you, Mayor and um, Mayor and, and Council Members. We're fortunate tonight to have uh, Jack Lunsford here with us, President and CEO of Westmark, one of our valued economic development partners here in the West Valley. He'll share with us tonight many of the accomplishments and key initiatives going forward that Westmark has. In addition, one of those key initiatives that they've been a great player in supporting us this last year is on the foreign trade zone. And so Westmark will um, be the organization that will represent all the cities here in the West Valley. I think you're aware of that, but I wanted to update you with that, and he'll give you some update on our foreign trade zone going forward as well. So with that, we'll turn the time over to Jack. Welcome. Mayor and Council, thank you very much. And, and actually, this is part of a series that I have been uh, doing at the request of Westmark's leadership and at the request of the West Valley mayors in going around to each and every one of the uh, uh, councils uh, in the West Valley. Just sharing with them an update on what's with Westmark. There are new council members um, every two years almost in some respects. And so some have a knowledge, some don't, some just read about us. So this was an opportunity for us to uh, uh, to, to come and share with you um, some exciting things going on in Westmark and for some a little bit of a history lesson. Um, very quickly, um, some may or may not know me. I'm a, I'm a proud native Phoenician. I'm a former bank officer twice. I was a radio station manager, an insurance licensee. I've been a consultant. Uh, I was the youngest county assessor in Arizona history. Um, I was a congressional fellow with Senator DeConcini. All of that proves that I couldn't hold a job. Um, uh, I was the founding director of Government Relations and External Affairs for Maricopa Community Colleges, and I spent 20 years doing that um, before I came in this role at Westmark. And when Westmark had its first meeting, and this is another thing that is it's a little factoid most people don't know, so I was actually the first board chair at Westmark. A uh, little trivia uh, about that, but I'm proud of it. Um, our mission is really simple um, to, for everyone, to promote the West Valley and advocate on its behalf. And we do that as a regional coalition among the leaders of business, government, uh, education, and the community organizations in Western Maricopa County. Now, that Western Maricopa County is comprised of 15 communities, as you well know, including both of the Sun Cities, who are, who are uh, over time have been members with us. Some both at the same time, sometimes one and not the other, and vice versa. We were established to act as a unified voice and a focal point for matters of regional significance for the West Valley. We do that by coordinating and facilitating our influence um, in Western Maricopa County on public policy issues. But it's important to note, as we have the partnership with our, with our government and our education partners, we are primarily funded by business and, and industry, and I'll get into that in a second. And so, moving on, um, this is a quick note. We are really diverse in terms of our leadership, and we continue to do, to be that way. Um, there's some good news and some bad news. Um, we've lost some institutional knowledge and memory on the executive committee um, because of changes in the economy, people's retirements, downturns, etc. But that has also brought us some really good creative um, uh, people. I want to point out that there are three elected officials on the executive committee, and that's probably a precedent before I got there. Um, uh, one mayor from the Northwest Valley, one from the Southwest Valley, and then Claude Maddox from the city of Phoenix. Um, and Claude was also, even though he's not the mayor, uh, it's appropriate that he's there because when we were founded, Claude was one of the eight or ten of us who were in the room, so it's important that he be a part of us as well. Um, all of our committee chairs are members of the executive committee uh, by, um, uh, by uh, bylaw, and that includes um, our own, your own, Harry Paxton as co-chair of economic development. And I'll talk about Harry's role in just a second. But again, you can see the diversity um, in terms of the areas that people rep represent. In most instances, we try to have 
a, a private sector and a public sector co-chair if that's possible. Again, continuing that linkage and that, that alliance between the private and the public sector. So that history I was talking about, um, in the 80s there were three West Valley advocacy groups. Northwest Valley Group was obviously in the northwestern part of the valley focused on transportation. Southwest uh, Valley Economic Group, some know it as the um, uh, Southwest Gateway Group was the other name that it was known by, Economic Development. The West Valley Alliance was the one that I was part of that I'll call was part of the Central West Valley. Um, and uh, that group had probably a broader um, uh, array of issues than the former two I mentioned. Uh, engaging in the Rio Salado project, county home rule, uh, preservation of the Paradise Parkway, the RPTA, and really the first issue where we testified publicly was to bring then Desert Sky, now Cricket Pavilion, to the West Valley. In 1988, the Morrison Institute, and I don't know whether they were called upon or whether they did it on their own, did a study of the effectiveness of the East Valley Partnership and came out that it was clearly effective as a group and as a voice. Um, and part of their focus was on the I-10, uh, or excuse me, the, the US-60 and the Superstition Freeway going to the East Valley. So in 1989, the three groups that I mentioned earlier uh, merged. And in 1991, um, we incorporated as Western Maricopa Coalition, Inc., and we we're a DBA as Westmark. Um, in 93, we evolved to such a point that we really need paid staff, and Diane McCarthy was hired as the first executive director, changed to president, and then I came on board um, after retiring from the community colleges in 2004. One of the things that I did when I came on board is I looked at our bylaws, and I said we either need to, I told the committee, uh, and, and I'm not sure, Mayor, if you were on the committee at that time or not, but I told the committee, I said, we either need to change the way we operate or change the bylaws because the two are not in sync. And so we took it upon ourselves, had a lengthy bylaw review process in 2005. And out of that, we came with 75 um, uh, members. Some think that that's unwieldy. We think it reflects our partnership. That's how many members are on our board of directors. And at the time, the municipalities were advisory board members, and we brought them officially onto the board saying, oh, again, if we're going to partner, then let's try to partner together. And from that, we had only two standing committees and six issue committees. The issue committees um, center around issues that are important in the West Valley, economic development, education, health care, public affairs, transportation, and water. And from that, we get our key initiatives. Um, and these are in no uh, way prioritized, and they continue to surface every year, um, but you can see they're reflective of the West Valley in terms of what our key initiatives are. The board, if I could take a moment, the board just went and had its annual retreat uh, Friday a week ago, and um, uh, actually not only reaffirmed these, but reaffirmed them with a set of, of action items and priorities such that we will be able to rate Westmark's attainment and the CEO and staff's accountability and attainment over the next year or so. So I mentioned that we were 80%, um, uh, I, I have 85% there, it's probably closer to 80% um, membership dues, um, and we're now changing that to investment. We want people to understand that, that we have an investment in Westmark and in the West Valley. So 20% of that comes from government. And then we drive um, uh, revenue from hosting a wide variety of events. And these events, by design, have to have a um, uh, relationship to our mission. We don't do them just for the sake of doing them. So we're providing information. We're, we're presenting um, people to the, to the West Valley that may not uh, come to the West Valley unless we do that. We just had Senator McCain, first time he's been in a, in a larger group. He's been in smaller groups. He's been to Fighter Country Partnership and others. But, but really in a broad, well-covered public event, um, it was the first time he'd done that in a while, and we were pleased to do that. So you can see that list. Um, Financially, about Westmark, we've got a budget of approximately $600,000, and that's down about $100,000 from, from a year and a half ago. It's a function of the, uh, of the economy. Um, 
so that you all have what we hope is a comfort level where we have a three-year annual budget that we revise annually. We have built-in financial dual controls. I'm an ex-bank officer. I understand dual cash control. Where CPA reviewed our last financial audit was in 2009. The board just um, accepted that as a clean audit. All of our last audits have been uh, clean audits, and we're proud of that. The executive committee reviews and approves monthly the financial statements, and there is a financial subcommittee if necessary. It's really important to understand our relationship um, as the, lar the operator of the largest enterprise zone in the state of Arizona um, that encompasses 14 municipalities and the Gila River Indian community. Um, we do this under contract with Maricopa County. Um, they probably couldn't do it for what they pay us. Well, we know they couldn't. Uh, and, and so it's a good deal all the way around, and we derive some revenue. But really, the idea, the notion that Westmark do this came from our member communities, um, where they said, you know, we should centralize this in one place, and that should be Westmark. Um, so uh, we just submitted our, our authorization. Uh, every five years we do that. Um, uh, or excuse me, the, the, we were reapproved with our application in 08. Um, interestingly enough, Enterprise Zone sunset uh, in 2011 by statute. And it'll be how it's determined whether, whether something changes in the jobs bill uh, that comes forward. There was something in the last jobs bill. Um, we don't believe it will impact our contract with Maricopa County because that'll be modified. We'll do some other economic development. It'll be reflected in what we do. But Westmark's exposure is about $18,000 in lost revenue. Um, if if we don't operate the enterprise zone in the current the current way that it's established, now there may be benefits for the broader community and state in doing that, but it's important that our folks understand what that what that impact is. Um, our accomplishments were, as you might imagine, we're really proud of these, and many of these we help spawn. Leadership West, we help spawn, and there are graduates of Leadership West in this room, and I won't name them because I'll forget somebody, but I know they're here. Um, uh, and the West Valley Recreation Corridor, we helped spawn. Um, West Mech, the uh, Career and Technical Education District, overlaid all the way to the West Valley, um, was, was a spawn of Westmark, and I am proud to be serving as an elected board member on the West Mac board. My term ends uh, this year, and I've chosen um, primarily for West Mac reasons and health reasons not to run for re-election. Um, but I will still find a way for West Mac and myself to be involved because it's, it's important to have a trained workforce. I mentioned the Enterprise Zone. And then in 2004, when all of the, the craziness was going on about university redesign and one university in many places and what was ASU West campus going to look like, et cetera, we issued a set of principles for the future of ASU West. And as a result of that, we, were, we received a visionary award um, for our work and for our effort. It also has brought about the continued dialogue that we have with Michael Crow and the university. Uh, and indeed, Michael was, we hosted him last week at a luncheon uh, at the Glendale Civic Center and, and just further cemented that relationship. Um, other accomplishments in 2004 um, uh, and 2005, I accompanied uh, many of the West Valley mayors back um, to D.C. with regard to the, uh, to the BRAC process. Um, that, as you well know, is driven by West Valley Partners now, but we continue to support Look Forward and Look West Valley Partners in that effort. Uh, we were a major part of the Business Leaders Coalition, which was formed after 9-11. Um, uh, Bill Post from APS formed that group, um, and, and we, were, we were key players in that. The Arizona Business Education Coalition, I had been on the board and the executive committee representing the West Valley and Westmark. We've got Herman Arcutt and Robin Berry from Palo Verde Elementary School District. They don't need me anymore. They're doing a great job, but we're still at the table. The Arizona Bioscience Roadmap Steering Committee, as they look at ways to bring bioscience employment to the West Valley, uh, all over the valley, but West Valley, that's my target, and I serve there. Um, MPAC no longer exists, but we were part of that effort. And then driven by um, the, the um, Westmark Economic Development Committee, 
Uh, 150 plus thousand dollars was raised to do a West Valley workforce and labor market study, which is up on our website. All of this is on westmark.org. Um, and already, uh, Greater Mar Maricopa Workforce Connections is looking with our communities to update that study. So that's something we think is value. And then these things we've already highlighted, uh, so I'll pass those. Some of our accomplishments we think that are important to, to all of our communities, but to our municipalities in particular. Um, we were one of the first organizations to oppose Prop 207 on regulatory takings in eminent domain, and we were the organization that got the business coalition to come out in opposition to it. Uh, at the same time on Prop 104 for municipal bonding for transportation and public safety initiatives and improve your capacity, we led that effort for the business coalition to come out in favor of it. Uh, we're really proud of that. In the West Valley, we helped, worked with the mayors. The mayors were honored by Westmark uh, with, with the Chairman's Achievement Award, but, but we were out on the campaign trail on Prop 400, and that still remains a, a key for us. Um, we helped found um, for the, the time initiative, and time is a four-letter word. I understand that to some people, but let me just tell you this. It came about from a conversation that I had with Rock Arnett, East Valley Partnership, my counterpart, and both of us said in Prop 400 there is no money west of the 303 or east of the 202 in the Southeast Valley in the Hunt Highway. What are we going to do and how are we going to find ways to fund our growth and expansion transportation infrastructure? That's how it came about. In terms of GIPLET, we've been at the table on government property lease excise tax. And that's important we do because that may become um, a, me a mechanism used in foreign trade zone, and I'll, I'll close with that in just a second. Um, we were opposed to national natural gas storage tanks at the end of Luke Air Force Base. I know that's a surprise um, that one would do that, but we were clearly opposed. Um, and then, again, in the education arena. So in talking about the foreign trade zone, um, first of all, um, a lot, a lot of credit goes to Harry Paxton and his counterpart, um, John Hagan, at City of Surprise for helping to bring this forward. This really evolved in Westmark's conference room. And then it was their vision, um, given some circumstances that came to light about the, the, the incorporation process and other communities and the advice of the consultant, it was their recommendation to come back and say, you know, Westmark represents the West Valley. They should be the applicant and ultimately the grantee for the foreign trade zone. So we have been working on that for about 10 months. We are ahead of our process. Our consultant, Curtis Spencer, told the board at retreat that we are probably 10 months, or excuse me, we are already ahead of the most aggressive pro forma scenario that he provided for us. He gave us a conservative, a moderate, and an aggressive one in terms of activity. And for us to get approval, which should happen in September or October, for the foreign trade zone uh, overlay designation, he believes is pretty significant and a real tribute not only not to Westmark, but to collectively everybody involved. When we had the public hearing right here, we had 27 um, communities, elected officials, private sector individuals, developers, etc., all in support of the foreign trade zone, no opposition. Um, and, and there was no opposition that surfaced in the public comment period. So since then, uh, the, the board of directors has been formed and actually met last week um, for its first meeting. We haven't had a need to meet, so we didn't meet. We now need to meet. We, we met. And we've also convened the advisory board, which is comprised of all of the, the, the municipalities who've either um, taken action, passed ordinances and tax policies, or have indicated that they wanted to do so. There are nine of those. Eight of those attended the meeting, and one of them was meeting with a potential operator uh, prospect, and that's why they couldn't meet with us. So there's activity around. It's not something that you see and hear on a regular basis, but we know about it. And uh, we're excited and looking forward to approval so that we can really start um, uh, on behalf of all of our communities, expanding it and marketing it and, and moving it forward. Um, what are our challenges? 
Well, they all center around infrastructure, partly for the West Valley, transportation, education, health care, not only bricks and mortar, but workforce pipeline, future of Luke Air Force Base, and in, and in many ways, governance. Um, I've been an elected official. I understand who constituents are. You know who your constituents are. There are going to be greater pressures over time on issues of regional significance for us to band together across our municipal boundaries and within our county boundaries. And we all, that, that's tough for us because we have to pay attention to our people who elected us first. But at some point in time, that's going to be something that, that, that faces us and we need, to, we need to be ready for it and be willing to work together, um, not to sacrifice our communities, but, but to solve issues relative to our communities. In closing, we ask this question all the time. What's the value of Westmark? What is the value to our members, to our communities, and to our region? And basically, we as staff say, if we can't answer these questions, then there's no need for us to be in existence. And so we try to do that on a regular basis. And if we're not doing it, we want people to tell us so that we can better do it. So with that, I thank the council, and I thank Harry for all of his leadership, and David Iwanski and the mayor and council, you've all been uh, great participants and great partners with us, and thank you very much, and I'm open to any questions you may have. Well, thank you very much, Jack. That's a very enlightening presentation. And I was told to be quick, so I tried. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, you have anything that you want to? Well, I, just, um, I would just like to say thanks to Jack and all of his support on the foreign trade zone because that has been a major undertaking. You know, we came before the council a year ago uh, with that, and we're getting very close to having that application approved. And and Jack's, uh, through Jack's guidance, bringing all of the uh, West Valley communities that agreed to participate in that, I think is going to give us a very powerful marketing norm going forward. He mentioned Curtis Spencer and with IMS Worldwide. We're very happy that we made that decision. He has a lot of connections, and I think his ability to market this to a lot of the companies that he works with and his expertise in this field will prove very valuable to, to all of us in the West Valley and, and especially the Goodyear as well, uh, since we are uh, moving forward with and working with prospects now. So thank you, Jack. Thank you all very much. Okay, any questions for Jack? Rolls on out of here. I, have, I just had one question. You. Um, Grab my attention. Thanks for coming, by the way, tonight. Um, the uh, you you mentioned the enterprise zone sunsetting in 2011, and but something to do with the jobs bill. And um, so, if in the future, if you can, if you can enlighten me, or you can, um, because both George and I have been um, very interested in that jobs bill, and uh, I'd like to see what that effect is on the enterprise zone. Mayor and Councilwoman Osborne, I'd be happy to, and I'd be happy to share it with anyone else. Uh, it was an issue that Westmark struggled mightily with, um, not on the elements. Ultimately, Westmark supported the elements that were changing the enterprise zone, but because that bill also included um, major tax reductions, um, there were questions that municipalities had in terms of, of ultimately what would be the impact on secondary assessment ratios, bonding capacities. Um, uh, some of them were worried about other revenue streams. Ultimately, uh, if, if the revenue is cut too much, um, what is the potential on state shared revenues? Um, all of those things come uh, into play. We wrestled really hard with that and ultimately came forward with a position to support um, even somewhat at our own expense to support the changes specific to the Enterprise Zone administration itself. And when we did that, we did it about two days before they resigned, or resigned, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was Freudian. So before they signed, he died. And, and because of that, um, our, our position never became fully public, okay? Um, but our, our um, Economic Development Committee uh, met last week, um, talked about this one in particular. It's going to come back again. Um, our hope is is that we can have the dialogue with, with GPEC so that they don't get caught up in it. And I, I have to tell you, I've been doing this for 35 years. The politics 
of, of that issue, if things could stand on their own merit as opposed to being brought together collectively, I think there would be better chances. But that remains to be seen. And I'll be happy to go into depth if you'd like. Okay. Thank you, sir. Appreciate you coming. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks Chad. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Joe? On signs. Temporary signs. Thank you, Harry. Evening, Mayor and Council. <clears throat> Excuse my voice, it seems like it's leaving me tonight for some reason, I don't know why. <clears throat> and the scratch on my forehead was where the tree got me right before it knocked me off the ladder, so. Okay. <laughs> I was ask you about that. I'm just curious sitting here looking at you. <clears throat> but the good news is I broke the fall with my head oh. and uh, <laughs> nothing broke. That's good. So. <laughs> could make it tonight. Okay, so uh, we're here to talk about temporary sign regulations. And so what I'd like to do first is uh, just go briefly over uh, the background for it, talk about reviewing the existing regulations, report on enforcement efforts, review practices of other cities, and discuss possible changes. Uh, to set the stage, most businesses, uh, and we're, and we're going to talk about commercial businesses primarily because that seems where the concern is coming from. Um, they're entitled to have a certain number of permanent wall signs and the square footage of which is limited by how much of the building face they have exposed. Usually it's about one square foot on the front and a half a square foot on the side with the total of around the whole building adding up to uh, no more than 200 square feet. And then on freestanding signs where a business is on its own lot it can have a, a monument sign that's limited to 132 square foot sign, eight feet high. But in a commercial center where you have three or more businesses, you typically have, um, a lot of times you have a comprehensive sign package, but then you also see the multi-tenant signs, multi-tenant identification signs, one per 330 feet of frontage, and generally speaking, two per uh, street frontage. So that, that's the principal way of identifying the, uh, the business location. But then there's uh, certain instances where temporary signs come into play, and most businesses take, ad take advantage of some of these to uh, some extent. Uh, there are basically two categories. There's te temporary signs where there's a permit required, and then there's a, a category where there's no permit required. On the no permit required, uh, there's typically window signs. They'll put the sign up inside the window. It's not supposed to exceed about 25% of the total window area. Uh, you'll see signed walkers, as you are, know a lot about, and you know that the legislature made that in, uh, prohibited us from regulating them or prohibiting them, and so we, we do regulate them, so that's why you see the signed walkers uh, out and about. Real, real estate for sale signs is, is a typical temporary sign that you see we don't require permits for, unless it's a big one for like a big residential development or a big commercial development then it's typically a larger sign and then we, we will require a permit for that. And then other things like garage sale signs. The temporary signs that businesses usually uh, use are in two categories, the grand opening sign and then special promotion sign. The grand opening sign is, a, is generally a 148 square foot banner per street frontage 30 days from opening. The special promotions is 148 square foot banner per street frontage 10 days with 30-day intervals in between displays. And this used to be uh, uh, a permit required type of sign and still is, but now with the adoption of the user fee stu uh, study recently, we now charge a $35 fee. So that, that was a change July 1st. Um, additional temporary signs, uh, for those signs that I just talked about, the grand opening and special promotions, they're not supposed to be animated, they're not supposed to be illuminated. Um, they're not supposed to place pennant banners or displays of on or above the roof. If they have balloons and inflatable devices, that can be part of the permit, and they're supposed to be tethered. Uh, the balloons may not exceed the maximum building height of, a zoning of the zoning district. So a lot of times you'll see the automobile dealerships, they'll come to us and they want to have a balloon up, 
and so they get a permit for that. <clears throat> there are the gorilla and what have you. Yeah, that's an inflatable, and they can have that with a permit. What about those those? Um, Oh, I don't even know what to call him, but the sign you, dancer, the dancer guy. Yeah, the air the is dancer. blowing him up. Yeah, that's, that would be considered. That's considered enough. animated, so it's it typically has not been allowed. Really. Oh. Then some other prohibited temporary signs, obviously signs on utility poles, street lights, traffic signals, signs on public right of way, off-site signs, roof signs, and, and portable signs, and those include A-frame signs. Uh, except as otherwise allowed in 7-9. So there's, there's a provision in the code that says you could have this type of sign under the special promotion, but generally speaking, most people don't do it under the special promotion because of the time limit. The most, in terms of enforcement efforts, the most common violations are signs in the public right-of-way or attached to a utility pole. I mean, no matter how many regulations you got, people still try to do that until they're taken down. Uh, bandit signs, garage and yard sale signs, the A-frame signs, and the wind sale signs uh, are the ones that seem to, to get the most attention. For signs in the public right-of-way, uh, it's my understanding that code compliance officers have the authority to remove and confiscate those. But for signs on private property, they generally will contact the owner and direct that it be removed if it's, if it's, uh, uh, if it's not removed or if it's replaced it after removal then they can issue a citation if they see uh, fit. Uh, this slide isn't as probably as re readable as it should be, but it tries to give you a, a, a feel for what some of the other cities are doing. And we looked at uh, several other cities in the valley, about 10 of them, what, what they do with A-frame signs, banners, inflatables, and flags. For the most part, um, on the banners and inflatables and flags, they all permit them as in, in a manner much in the way we do. But on the A-frame signs, there are a number of cities, Chandler, Glendale, Peoria, Phoenix, Scottsdale, who at least in their regulations say that they're not allowed. Now, I know as much as anybody else, when you drive around, you see them. So I think enforcement a lot of times is, is part of that issue. As a matter of fact, one of the other planners in, in uh, Gilbert that I talked to uh, said the same thing. He mentioned that Mesa prohibits them, but they just don't have enough code enforcement officers to, to go after it. What's, what's Tempe's restrictions? Can you quickly say, or is that? Um, I, Tempe wasn't one of the ones I had surveyed, um, but I was just uh, recounting whether Planner and Gilbert had told me about the about A-frame signs. Although they so, I know, I mean, it says yes with oh, restrictions on the A-frames. That's what I was... I was thinking Mesa. <clears throat> Tempe, the yes with the restrictions is they allow them uh, out in front of the business, within three feet of the door of the building, and no more than ten feet from the well, no more than ten feet from the bu three feet from the building, and within ten feet of the door. So, in other words, not out in like the parking lot median or right. something like that, uh, adjacent to a, a roadway or something. I see. Right, and I think that probably is directed more toward the kind of pedestrian environment, where you might have like you know today's daily special is this and such, uh, where. Um, where a lot of businesses do seem to try to use them for uh, attention getting for tra traffic going by, which is uh, <clears throat> not exactly what uh, Tempe has in mind. Uh, there we go. They allow A-frames <laughs> They allow a -frames that sing uh, within three feet of the building and ten feet of the front entrance. Singing A-frames now. Sings. Sings. <laughs> Yeah, blast, blast that spell check. <laughs> Gilbert, uh, I talked a lot about in the, in the staff report in the yellow paper that Gilbert was recently going through kind of a similar discussion. Uh, they revised their sign regulations to allow more A-frame and flying banner signs for businesses, particularly the ones that are less than 10,000 square feet. Uh, they've made this change now, as I understand it, for 24 months, and then they intend to revisit the, regula the regulations, they've made it uh, essentially permanent unless they change it again back uh, in 24 months after they uh, see how it works out. And generally their regulations allow up to three per business with one. It can be out at the street and then the, the A-frames are limited to seven square feet in area, flying banner signs to 18 square feet. And then they have other restrictions about 
if you're out on this if they're out on the street they have to be 20 feet apart from one another and uh, so forth is that seven, oh, 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 is that seven feet per side so yes seven, okay yes it's actually 24 inches wide by 44 inches tall Joe, how are we treating these fluttering signs, you know, the tall poles? Right, right there. The flying banners, the flying uh, banners. I took the liberty of using the bad examples oh. from Avondale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought that would be diplomatic. <laughs> but, By the car wash. <laughs> we will allow those as, a, as a, a temporary sign, like a banner, if they want to permit it under the special promotion. Um, but since you only can have one, in this particular slide, there's actually three of them there. One's kind of hiding behind the other one, and you can't really read what they say anyway, but they, uh, that was an example of a flying banner. And then some A-frame and bandit signs as you go into a parking lot. So that's where kind of how you see them used a lot. You know, there is a lot of exposure for the signs throughout the city. But understanding the, uh, the staff is, is so small that they're, they're overcome by the influx of, the, of these signs. So I don't know how we're going to control them other than having the police, as they go through their routes, picking them up and, and, and dropping them off someplace. But I don't know, that's, a, that's probably not one of their their, their services. So but well, it does uh, cause a problem as we currently. Code Compliance has done actually a very good job um, of keeping up with things because, as I, I kind of said it half-kiddingly, that to find bad examples, I had to look somewhere else because the community is 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 conforming to what most of the regulations are. There are exceptions, but there's going to be exception to whatever rule we make. Uh, but overall, the appearance of the community is really relatively pretty good. Uh, considering, Garage sales are, yeah, they're bad. <laughs> they're bad. And then, of course, you know the things that happen on the weekends are the things that yeah. They, they, they sometimes they disappear by Monday. But Joe, so, Joe, quick question for you: What's the demand from a business side on the A-frames? Are you getting any requests, especially in these economic climates, to to put more A-frames out uh, signs in front of their businesses to try to drag, you know, try to draw more, you know, business to their specific, uh, you know, establishment? Are, are you getting, you know, more requests that type of thing from them? What, well, uh, uh, Councilor Priscilla, mostly what we get are complaints the, from the ones that have A-frame signs and then code t contacts them and says, you're not supposed to have it. So it's usually uh, responsive <clears throat> rather than pro proactive where they, where they come in and say, can I have one? Mm -hmm. uh, it's usually, eh, you're not supposed to have that. But I guess what I'm, I guess what I'm asking is, are you getting um, more, I guess more of them are the demand, or, or they're trying to get one one step up as a result of the current economy to try to try to display what their product is or what their you know specials are to try to get people you know coming through their specific business. Are you getting more than than you normally would as a result of the uh, economic climate out there? Well, I I think there definitely is more interest in it right now than there has been perhaps in the past, and specifically for that point, um, I was dealing with a, a business the other day who who really wants to. You know, comply. I mean, it, you know, he, he was very friendly about it and said, you know, he wants to do the right thing, but the advertising that he gets off the, uh, this particular banner sign, um, he says he can tell the difference between when he's got it out and when he doesn't have it out. And so, uh, it's difficult. It's difficult to uh, try to find that happy medium between what looks good and what helps our business community. Right. Or do you find it's those flex building, it's in those, those stores that are kind of buried, you know, where Penny's is and Lowe's is, everybody's kind of buried in there. And so to get some type of advertisement, it makes it very difficult for them. And I see more of those in those areas, which I can understand. Well, there's, there's two problems related to that. The, the flex buildings, a lot of the flex buildings were not built with the idea of providing exposure for uh, street exposure for their tenants. They, they go way deep into the property and, and then some of them, and particularly the one where I mentioned the guy I was dealing with, um, they don't even have multi-tenant signs out there. Why? Because the owner didn't want to put any multi-tenant signs out. He didn't want to invest in them and, and you know typically how the multi-tenant sign works, they'll put them out there but then they basically sell the space on the sign to the business. I mean it's not the building owner that uh, pays for it. I mean they pay for it initially but they recover it through their tenants. 
And then the second instance, which was the instance that Gilbert talked about, is where they had big power centers, you know, just got built, they f expected it to blow and go, then they lose their anchors, and now that the anchor's gone, the smaller guys are struggling. So, you know, there is a certain amount of that in the economy where maybe they didn't care as much before because the traffic was really churning, and, and now it's not churning as much. So this is my last two slides, I think, so I'll just run through them really quickly. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is promote public safety and welfare by safe placement of appropriate signage while maintaining a balance between business identification and high quality appearance. Temporary signs in the code right now are allowed for a specific purpose and not intended to be permanent. And I think one of the things we're starting to see now is people want, businesses may want to have banners that they keep up all the time as opposed to before where, I mean, I, I know there's one business that has a sale sign all, all the time. Well, and I guess it's on sale all the time, but, <laughs> but you know, maybe before you only had those signs out when there was an actual sale. So, um, and that exact point that you brought up, Councilor Lord, about the businesses about wanting the street exposure, but maybe they're in a flex industrial and they don't have that exposure and they don't have a multi-tenant sign. Um, right now, we allow uh, temporary signs for 90 days per year, but maybe that's not, still not long enough given the economy and uh, where sales, like I said, are continuous rather than periodic. But we want to be careful because um, if we relax the standards, even on a temporary basis, we may subject ourselves to a Prop 207 challenge if later on we think, well, maybe that wasn't such a good idea and we want to go back. Uh, it's possible that by trying to change it back, you could have someone come forward and say that's a, a Prop 207 taking because you're taking away something that you allowed me to do. Mm -hmm. uh, this I think they knew the consequences of that Prop 207 that got passed. No, no. It, 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 it not only provided some protections, but it also provided some handcuffs oh, to, to so us for doing like things. So oh. lastly, we said, we said maybe you want to consider ex maybe extending the, the time periods for special promotions, say from 10 days to 20 days to get more time for exposure. The grand opening signs going from 30 to 60 is probably r real reasonable. Um, these days, you know, a new business may need longer exposure than just the first 30 days. And then lastly, maybe considering A-frame signs adjacent to the buildings, much in the way that Tempe does theirs, uh, where they're not a distraction to traffic but can be easily read by pedestrians. Quickly, though, on that, that last point, um, when code has been out having these issues with the A-frames, can you tell me, is it more a majority of these A-frames are actually not right adjacent to the front entrance of that, that business, but they're further out? away from the building I mean which is it if we were to say you know what let's go ahead and, and allow those a-frames to be adjacent to the entries um, is that really doing us any good I mean what is the majority of these signs where are they located uh, council Osborne <coughs> you, you've touched on a good point because I'm not sure that this last point alone would satisfy what some of the people are doing now I mean it's not going to satisfy them <clears throat> there are businesses though that probably would benefit from this change alone that either are taking are, are trying to do that now or might take advantage of it if we if we made it permissible um, there's instances like in uh, Canyon Trails Town Center where I mean that's a 90 acre site if you're a tenant buried in the business uh, buried in the uh, development um, I can I can understand the desire for wanting to put something out and say hey I'm here Absolutely. but um, you know, the concern is, though, that you could have any number of businesses in there, and then uh, the trick is regulating then how many of the A-frame signs we get out there, because there may be 10 of those businesses that want that exposure, and then we'd have 10 A-frame signs lined up. So um, I had wanted to get out to Gilbert to see how their test was going so far, and I didn't get a chance. It's just so far away. <laughs> how about so, churches? Churches with the A-frame signs. <laughs> Yeah, there every Sunday. Yeah, uh, Councillor uh, Cavalieri, that it's it's that's a situation where they do it on Sunday, and we we generally out on you know code's not out on Sunday. But for the most part, they're pretty good about picking them up. <laughs> so they are uh, pretty good about that, I would say. So you don't think there's anything we can have written that by our lawyer that would protect us if we if we actually put a designated time frame uh, on this? 
on the length of time we're going to change this or allow these different signs to be used. I don't mean I don't mean like your option two or three that you showed me. I mean yeah, you're talking about whether we try to do something yeah, on an experimental is there basis. That, yeah, that we well, could have written up that would uh, protect us from Prop 207. Yeah. I, I'll defer to Rourke for the for the legal interpretation, but it, it would seem that it's hard to predict who who might bring anybody can bring a challenge whether or not they'll be successful. I guess I'll ask. But I mean, for. if we had something, at least we would have it on are. record. No, if you just put a sunset on there. Okay. Probably less risk if you put a sunset as opposed to just trying to revoke it later because then you have an established property right, is what they would argue. So, so if you did have a sunset, though, you think that. Could at least defend it on that basis. And more defensible. Uh, might be my, might be well, I can't imagine small businesses want to take the financial risk to, to go into a lawsuit over a sign outside of their building if they're a small business. I mean, you? Even presuming Prop 207 applies to this situation, I, I don't think I really thought that one through too much at this point. But I can see the argument. They would say it's a, it's a property right and leads to diminution of value as defined in the statute. Could you do that before we even consider Yeah, I think we probably want to think that through and do a little research and get back to you on that. Yeah, I, I know that Avondale got into one where they changed the zoning ordinance, say, instead of a zero setback in the front, they had required a 20-foot or 30-foot setback in the front of commercial property, and they got sued over that saying that the setback alone was a taking because they didn't have to do it before. Right. Now they have to do it. So just, but again, there's there's not a lot of law out there on, on Prop 207, so it's difficult to predict mm -hmm. uh, success uh, one way or the other. I just think it's the advantage of the city and to the retailer to be able to increase their business during this uh, economic downturn. And, and this is one small way if we can find a compromise in this and your different options for a short period of time, because you know I've come to your office several times in this because I've got lots of calls from different small businesses on it. So it Joe, would, I'd appreciate checking in some of these other areas. Joe, can you give us an example how point three would be applied? I'm thinking, for example, of the Target Shopping Center, of across the street, the Pier 1 Shopping Center, um, that these center you mentioned, the Target Center down in Canyon Trails. Mm -hmm. This doesn't help anybody, does it? I think it helps the small guy, doesn't it? I would think, I can't imagine. I, I think the first two are for any business, but largely larger business. But the third one is helps the small guy. But there again, it's against, where I see them is against the roadways. I mean, in my own shopping center, we have no multi-tenant sign, and I, I see where they go, and, but they're not having, it's not like the sandwich shop that says, hey, today's daily special is this, and it's right outside their door. It's clear out there at the, at, on the road. That's where I'm seeing a majority the of them. That's who helps the little shopping guy. centers, all the stores are filled. No, no, I'm just saying anybody. I'm just saying any shopping center, that's where I see them. Are these A-frames are out there I, by I the I think road. you have to look at how the shopping center is designed. Yours is flat. Well, sure. So you can see it from, from Litchfield. You can see it from the side on both the side roads. You can drive right straight by all the stores in there and see them all. And we have so much out there now in these small cubby holes that they're just buried. And but that's the point you know, of the last one is that I don't know that that's going to – it may help – the sandwich shop that changes daily, you know, specials, but it's not going to help the the little um, other building that has no exposure. So, I don't. I, don't, I think, guess we're going to have to hear from Rourke more on that one. All you have to do is go around down McDonald Road within the city and see how it, there are about three or four that are out there right now. So, well, I think code compliance sanitation has kind of just. Uh, turned to the left and, and looked away on a on a busy Saturday or or something, uh, uh, and they know, but they they're understanding too that these people want to make money, and of course if we want them money, to make money. We get tax revenue, so I mean it, it's it's a chain that's beneficial. So mm -hmm. uh, I think Code has tried to do their best, to, and as well as our department, when we talk to people, of trying to figure out ways where they can get some exposure, uh, but it's not always satisfactory. Uh, we recognize that the suggestion we made was pretty limited, but we need we need to hear from the council as far as 
what what you think as a group is acceptable and which direction we should go, and then we certainly can pursue whatever direction we get. Well, I said yay for the 20 day and the 30 day in between. Uh, and option two it was. I think that's your option two. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was a compromise and, and wouldn't disturb the signage look so much as maybe some of the others did. I like all three of them myself. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what, if, if you were, and you're talking to business, how would you prioritize them from the standpoint of what the, what the private sector would like to see of those three about equal, or is there one that really stands out? Well, Mr. Mayor, I, I think all three of them can help business to some extent. Um, whether it goes far enough for what some of the businesses are asking for, I, I kind of doubt that. Uh, I think that's what uh, Councilor Osborne was driving at, is that what they really want is they want that exposure out on the street. If they're buried back in the center, they want that exposure out on the street. But then that brings up the question, if we want to follow uh, a model like Gilbert's doing, where they're, they're allowing you know, each business that's small to have an A-frame sign out on, the, out on the roadway. And up till now, we, we, we deal with that on a regular basis, but it's not, it's not allowed. So that's kind of where we need direction. I, I think all three of these would be welcome to some extent. <clears throat> hey, J Joe, just just real quick, I, I kind of like the all, th all three, too, as well. And I think in this economy, it's whatever we can do to kind of help business out would be great. The only question I would have, though, is if you go to the Canyon Trails there where that target is, you don't know what a lot of those businesses are until you drive through there because they're all tucked in. I mean, you don't know what they are. I, I don't know which, I don't know what the answer is to try to help them because when I go in there, there's still, and there's still a lot of empty shells in there so uh, when they do come in you know how do you know what's there whether it's retail whether it's a pizza place whether it's a hairdresser or whatever the case may be and I don't know if I'm real crazy about having a-frames all up down the side of the road but I don't know what the answer is to, to try to spur on some of those businesses as people go by and they have no idea what's in there so uh, I think in this economy whatever we can do to kind of help business within reason you know what I mean so it doesn't look like a clutter of signs I think it's a kind of a good thing but those are the kind of things where I'm not sure how you address that issue, you know, um, from the a -frame. And that, that is the difficult part about trying to do something that they could think was useful, but then without opening the door so far that we end up with a lot of clutter. So we struggle with it too. Uh, I, I just have a question. Remember the, uh, and I think we still have them, when we had a lot of development going in the city, we had kind of that round metal sign and we had the different, were those ours or those were those development community? Well, they actually belong to the sign company, uh -huh. and the um, and then they have a contract with us where they lease the uh, uh, they rent the space on the sign to the, the home builders. Is there a way that we could do something like that where the store then could lease and it wouldn't it wouldn't be it wouldn't be as much money for them as like a big one and I don't know what it costs for because I think each development has about that much space this but it was like a little multi-directional uh, uh, is there any way that yeah. they're actually bigger they're bigger than you think mm -hmm. bigger than thing, mm -hmm. but you know those them. would be more in an organized manner they wouldn't be all over and we could put those right out there mm -hmm. um, and they were they were fairly good looking so something like an organized temporary yeah sign. yeah that's 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 yeah they okay. were uh, well frankly oh, they had angle homes, circle and like this they were dug in the ground different slots in them and the builders put right. their names and it, the it showed direction arrows, right, as you know back yeah. here we call those our kiosk signs kiosk, and those are the but they ones were very that we, thin and they could be put right. on we did it specifically to get away from the bandit signs yeah and, and then mm -hmm. that would and and maybe they'd have to do a small charge for that we still have those Yes. yes. Yeah, I've seen them around the city, and it, 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 it'd be a small charge that maybe would cover the idea, but it would at least give them advertisement, and they wouldn't have to be taking them in out, and code wouldn't have to be going like this all the time. <laughs> it might well, certainly out. something we can we can look into. Joe, so, do you have any idea how code is handling electioneering signs? Um, no, sir, I don't. <laughs> oh, Gail's here, so yeah, okay, thank Gail. God. Well, you're gonna ask you. <laughs> Carefully. Yeah, this yeah. way. Right. I, I didn't want to yeah, touch that one. Right. Yeah, very carefully. Yeah, this way. Um, we haven't done anything with, with the election signs at all. Um, we have been getting some p notices from people wanting to know when they're going to start coming down, and we tell them 10 days after the election. So 
10 days after the primary, we should start to see some of them coming down. And if they do not come down after the 10 days, um, we take them. What about the people won. that won? What <laughs> about the people who won the election? They, they stay up until after the general election. Yeah, so those yeah. people can keep theirs up. Yeah. Okay. Only I've the seen, ones that I'm lost. Sorry. I've seen a lot of uh, Bennett and Dunn signs out there. Those, those people aren't coming back to pick them up. That's for sure. They, if, if they're still they there and we know which ones, because I don't have a list of who lost and we'd have to research that, but we, we would go pick them up eventually and remove them. And then do you find them? No. You just I thought there was a fine. There, there could be, but we, and we don't do that with any of the signs we confiscate. I think in the election laws, it says yeah, somewhere in there, I thought it was said I thought it said there was a fine. That you could get fined. Yeah. There, there, so there, so there, a there could be a fine. But there was so much a sign. I think there could be a fine too. <laughs> Another revenue? Is that what, <laughs> what, it, what, it would, what it would be was we would have to issue a citation. Mm. It's going to so. cost more than your fine. Yeah, we don't want to cost more than your fine. <laughs> <laughs> no. gotcha. That's another thing we have to look at in the future is citations, the length, length of time that uh, we notify property owners to clean up and two, three months it's still there. Uh, I, I, I'm going to make a proposal for that. If that uh, Unfortunately, uh, uh, Councilmember Sousa, most of it's governed by state law. Not two to three months, but one month minimum. Yes. Well, yeah, but we're going, we're going beyond that, aren't we? Um, what, on abatements, when I'm doing an abatement, let's say the property's vacant, it's been foreclosed on, or it's in limbo some way, it's a required 30-day notice to the property owner. Um, and so after the 30 days, then we can go in and clean it up. But it's a required 30 day. And you charge back time and, and cost. We charge cost and, and then a, a small administrative fee. Uh, one, one last question. This may have changed over time, but I don't think it has. Um, people that leave up sale signs, okay, um, as far as I understand is that you have to have a time period when you're not having a sale, and that was by law. And I wonder, I mean, now I suppose somebody could skirt around it and say, well, that drink was on sale, but, but now this drink is on sale. I mean, I don't know how that gets, a, gets around, but just uh, thought I'd mention that for the people that leave. And by the way, business owner, it's not good for business to leave was a sale. Of <laughs> out of business sale sign. Well, you know, well, or just sale, you know, you're not supposed to do that, and so. Uh, I just thought I would mention that. So what I'm hearing from the council is you like the three suggestions we made. Maybe we should look at maybe expanding some way of having an organized temporary sign at shopping centers other than the multi-tenant signs. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that you would like to see us maybe go forward with that or any other ideas we come up with. And hearing works. Um, thought process. Yeah, work on feedback on the a sunset clause. Mm -hmm. If we do a sunset, can we do it for like maybe I don't I don't know what the time period. Just for example, a year, and then if the economy still hasn't improved, could we have it in our provision like that? It we could extend it for another year before it sunsets or something like that. You you just reauthorize and extend it. That's all you have to be do. Be a separate action. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah back to you. Good, it's sort of important that it be done relatively soon, though. Yes. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Yeah. It just they helps are. even a little bit. Yeah, anything that keep them out of Avondale, keep them in good year. <laughs> well, it's terrible to be we in a business the all day. Zoning commissioner here, so. <laughs> be in the business all day, never careful. get anybody come in during the whole day. I mean, you know, we yeah. need to help them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Good. Good. Charles McDowell, Dave Iwanski. Mayor, Council. Eddie, could I have uh, Elmo, please?
that, that'll work fine. As you all know, um, Goodyear has the distinction of having two designated Superfund sites, so-called PGA North and PGA South. This map orientates folks to the, the general location of where these are. On the north, we have Van Buren Street here. This is Litchfield, MC85 down along the southern border, and then Bullard on the, on the west side. PGA South located here in the airport section. PGA North located up here where the unit dynamics and the crane company building was located. The impact to the city over the years has been the loss of four production wells, four drinking water wells. Roughly 2.1 million gallons a day has been lost. The other unknown is the uncertainty of existing water wells and potential contamination for those. Cleanup of these sites has been ongoing for almost 20 years in the case of PGA South. Goodyear Tire and Rubber jumped on that pretty quickly in the beginning, and they've done a good job, an effective job, of getting that cleaned up. PGA North has not been as, as uh, effectively attacked by Crane Company. They didn't uh, jump on it as aggressively in the beginning, and um, <coughs> therefore that bloom is still migrating you know, pretty much to the northeast. Let me ask you a question right now. What activity is going on relative to this on Palm Valley at 135th by the school? There's a number of, of wells that are going in. Some are monitoring wells. Some are uh, injection wells. All designed to either track plume movement or curtail plume movement. There's a number of wells that are planned and will be going in over the, over the next several months. That's part of the work <coughs> plan that has been developed with EPA and Crane to move along there their cleanup activities. But does this have anything to do with the condition of the water? No, at the present time. Okay. It's a, it's a method to track and to, con to contain that plume movement. The city has also been very active in supporting EPA in terms of its, its uh, a more aggressive approach with Crane Company. A number of letters have gone out. Mayor, you, you signed one recently. City Manager John, you signed one recently that went out to express our support for the new work plan. And so tonight, the presentation tonight will give an overview of the, the two sites. It will give a summary of, of where we are with plume containment, how far the plume has moved, um, what the effectiveness has been with, with each of those two sites. We'll talk briefly about the remediated water. The remediated water or the treated water is a resource in actuality, and it's something that we need to think about in terms of how do we use that in our water portfolio. There's value to that. And we'll talk a bit about that, and then we'll talk a bit about um, the public policy decision of using that water for potable versus non-potable uses. As you know, some communities do that already. The technology is there. It's an issue of public education and, and uh, perception for the most part. So that's the intent for this evening. Um, I'll turn it over to David, and then we'll take um, questions and answers throughout the presentation. Thank you, Charles. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council, good evening. PGA North Superfund Sites Overview, and as Charles mentioned, uh, plume status. We want to educate you as, as uh, much as possible and, and answer questions along the way. Tonight's agenda to address PGA South, the history, the plume overview, and a summary. The same with PGA North, our history, plume overview, and a summary. The impacts, both direct and indirect, to the city of Goodyear Water Resources. And finally, the discussion on remediated groundwater. We want to orientate you with the glossary of terms. When we say PGA, it's Phoenix Goodyear Airport South, which is the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company as the principal responsible party and Phoenix Goodyear Airport North, where Crane Company is the principal responsible party. Subunit A is where the predominance of contamination occurs. It's between ground surface down to 120 feet below ground surface. We also are seeing contamination in subunit C, which is in the deeper part of the aquifer uh, from ground surface to 180 feet below ground surface. <laughs> Extraction wells, those are the wells that are pumped to draw contaminated water to the surface for treatment. 
When we make references then, when we say EA06, for example, that's the one that uh, several of our uh, council members and mayors attended the, uh, uh, the event two years back already. It means extraction well A from subunit A <coughs> and number 06. Injection wells are also used to take water that's treated, cleaned, and re-injected into the aquifer. Monitoring wells, as Charles mentioned, are simply used to obtain water quality samples to map the outer edges of the plume and to map various levels of contamination within the exterior boundaries of the plume. Trichloroethylene, it's easy for me to say, I say it often, that's TCE, it's the contaminant that causes adverse health effects, primarily attributed to degreasing uh, solvents. MCL is the federal safe drinking water maximum contaminant level. In the case of TCE, it's five parts per billion, the equivalent of 2.5 teaspoons in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. PGA South history from 1943 to 1968, the U.S. Navy, Goodyear Aerospace Corporation, and the Laurel Defense Corp. used this site for aircraft maintenance and related activities. Degreasing solvents were used in these maintenance activities and were dumped on site, causing the contamination and creating a hazardous waste dump. The city of Phoenix purchased the site in 1968 for use as an airport. In 1980, the federal government funded the Superfund program to clean up these hazardous waste, waste sites. The US EPA was charged with creating a national priorities list of these sites. These were prioritized based on audits performed to record the actual levels of hazardous waste present at that facility. An audit performed on PGA South recorded levels of trichloroethylene, TCE sufficient to add to uh, the national priority list in September of 1983. In 1991, the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company entered into a consent decree with EPA and the Justice Department. Three main treatment systems were developed to begin removing TCE contaminants. These are outlines and it gives you a reference you can see. There's Yuma Road, essentially the, the outline of the PGA South for subunits A and subunits C. There's the northern subunit C plume, which is outlined in yellow, located north of Yuma Road and east, or excuse me, west of Litchfield. You have the subunit C uh, plume outlined in green. That's south of Yuma Road across the northern portion of the runway and tarmac. And then subunit A, which is outlined in kind of that uh, raspberry color, uh, which essentially ran uh, uh, underneath the, uh, uh, the runway and, and the tarmacs. So these are your points of reference. Keep in mind these are the original plume outlines. PGA South, the TCE removal from subunit A. You can see in 1998 the plume size as well as the levels of contamination, which were uh, uh, anywhere between that 100, 200, 300 parts per million, or excuse me, per billion. Again, keep in mind that five parts is the, is the MCL. The progress is significant in that the plume has not only shrunk between 1998 and 2009, but the levels of contaminant have also been uh, mitigated significantly. Uh, Council member? And that's only because we have equipment on site, right? Uh, that's because, as Charles referenced, that the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, pursuant to their consent decree, took their responsibility seriously, uh, employed enough financial and technical resources to attack the plume. And that's ongoing? Yes, sir. This is that TCE uh, subunit C southern plume. Once again, you can see not only the size of the plume, but the significant levels of contaminant that were present in 1994 and the progress that's been made to 2008. And progress does continue. This is the PGA South TCE uh, subunit C north plume. This is the one north of Yuma that was referenced in that first map. Once again, uh, and I hate to be re redundant, but you can see not only the size of the plume that's been shrunk, but also the levels of contaminant have been uh, mitigated significantly. This, the, these are snapshots of significant progress that has been made over the last 10 plus years. 
So in summary, uh, EPA estimates that 80% of the total mass of TCE contaminants have been removed. Removal of 100% of the total mass of TCE contaminants is anticipated by 2020. What this means is that the levels of contaminant will be non-detect. Since 2005, the average volume of water pumped and treated annually from the site is 0.3 billion gallons, which is 300 million gallons. <laughs> Gotta get my decimal points right. The fiscal impact, the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company reported they have spent $37 million on all related cleanup activities for PGA South. We got this figure directly from the project manager. Hey, Dave, Mayor. We, since 68, have we lost any uh, wells as a result of South, PGA as, South? As a result, not, not city uh, service area production wells, no, sir. Irrigation type wells. We, there have been some wells that have lost, to, uh, that have been lost, but not city owned wells. That's totally different from this site. Yeah, uh, the, and, and it's a good question because we'll see all the wells that have been lost in the PGA North slides. There's, some, there, there's a little bit of dispute in terms of whether the loss of C, COG5 was north related or south related. We, we consider it north related. This is the Unidynamics uh, Crane Company site. Brief history here. In 1963, Unidynamics began manufacturing and testing components for weapons program and defense-related operations. Ownership was transferred to Unidynamics Phoenix, Inc. in 1970. From 1963 until 1980, degreasing solvents used to clean components that were manufactured at the site were dumped, contaminating the soil and creating hazardous waste. In addition, there was an awful lot of uh, munitions and defense-related work uh, ongoing at that facility as well. Under the, once again, uh, under the Federal Superfund program, EPA performed an audit of the site that recorded concentrations of TCE sufficient enough to add the site to the national priorities list in September of 1983. Crane Company acquired the site from UPI in 1985 and continued operations until 1994. From 1990 through 2003, EPA issued a number of unilateral administrative orders requesting Crane Company to perform ingress, uh, investigation and remedial action. As a result, excuse me, as a result of the contamination, the city lost a portion of its higher quality water from COG4 in 95, COG5 in 98, COG2 in 2003, and COG10 in 2001. Again, Charles mentioned that's a cumulative loss of 2.1 million gallons a day. And when Public Works references higher quality water, that is the lowest cost to produce. We don't need to send this water through RO. It's high quality, low cost to produce water. In 2006, Crane Company entered into a consent decree with EPA and the Justice Department. That was also the year that Crane Company settled its litigation with the city for 1.95 million in addition to the million dollars that we received for our Brownfields um, Supplemental Environmental Project. That 1.95 million represents loss of potable water. This, this is the real challenge and, and these colors are, are very demonstrative in terms of how this plume as opposed to PGA South where you, where you saw plume shrinkage and reduced con contaminant levels. In 1995 at PGA North, you can see kind of that uh, purple color. That was the, um, uh, the outline of the plume. In 2005, you can see where the blue coloring is and how that plume has migrated and expanded. And then lastly, in 2010, the kind of uh, goldenrod color that uh, <laughs> connotes where that plume uh, has, has migrated and expanded too. You can see the number of when, uh, again, we referenced monitoring wells which take water quality samples. The, the, the real uh, wells of concern are City of Goodyear 10 um, produced 0.3 MGD gallons. That was lost to contamination. COG 4, 7.7 MGD was lost to contamination. COG 5, 0.3 MGD of loss production, and then COG2, uh, once again, 0.7 MGD of production. Um, obviously, this, this has, a, has a serious impact on our, on our water supply. But, but again, if you note the colors and how this plume has, has uh, migrated and increased contaminants, uh, 
have, have uh, increased as well. Points of reference, these are the proximity to other existing city production wells. You can see uh, where our city of Goodyear 18A and 18B, uh, just south of I-10 and west of, of Dysart. COG-6 is noted, uh, COG-1 is noted, COG-11, COG-19. So you can see uh, the, the other production wells in relation to this plume. And the one that we are recently concerned with is COG-3, once again, one of our lower cost producing uh, very good wells, 0.9 MGD. We consider that at risk. Now, these are the four wells that you say we've lost. Uh, council member, these, these are the remaining uh, existing city production wells. The four wells that we actually lost and, and have been abandoned are, are the four that are noted on this slide. When were they abandoned? Uh, the, COG 10 was um, 2006. 2006. March of 2006. The, the abandonments for four took place in 95, COG 5 in 98, COG 2 in 2003, and COG 10 in 2005. Well, these were a result of? Contamination, TCE right. contamination, yes, sir. Now, when we settled this million and a half dollars, with Crane, did that alleviate their responsibility from, from us suing them for uh, getting some compensation for the four wells that we lost? That settlement, Rourke, if um, the, the specifics of the settlement, I don't know if you wanted to go into that or if we could provide that under a separate cover. No, my recollection is specifically 10 was referenced and one of the other wells was referenced, but I think all four were referenced that we'd lost. Correct. But the dollars were, I believe, for two replacements is kind of what was in, envisioned. It, it, okay. It, I, did, I didn't know if that was specifically it's legal. It's public record. Okay. It, uh, COG 10, the, the compensation, the $1.95 million, was for the loss of production for COG 10 and for the loss of production in COG 2. In addition, there was a dispute as to um, abandonment, whether the abandonment of COG4 was a city of Goodyear responsibility or Crane responsibility. The total cost associated with that was about 450000 We settled as part of the $1.95 million for replacement water. We ended up negotiating successfully that that entire $450,000 payment would be made by Crane. And then in the future, the terms of the consent decree for replacement water, replacement well kind of dictates what happens if we have another well that's contaminated. At the present time, how many wells are in danger? In, in, our, in our professional judgment, COG3 is the only one that is immediately at risk. But, but again, when you take a look at, at the plume contamination um, migration, we, we're going to do everything possible to protect, protect all the rest of our our production wells. Okay, but so the, the immediate risk is to COG3. So if we go down on three, do we have any recourse, recourse against Crane? Yes, there's a, there's a provision in the contract that sa states that for future losses of wells, they're required to replace that, that well for us. Okay. All right, thank you. Most Let well. Let me ask you a question, Dave. Uh, are our neighbors, uh, Liberty Water and uh, Avondale Water, are they at risk? Of, do they have wells at risk? Immediate, like COG3. Mayor, the city of Avondale has two production wells uh, that, are, that are located uh, up uh, just uh, around McDowell. Two production wells that we consider, or at least Avondale, the city of Avondale considers at risk. And further to the north, there are two production wells that uh, Liberty Water Company, they consider to be um, at risk as well. Neither, neither Avondale nor Liberty uh, has lost any production wells. But once again, you can see because of the plume migration that uh, that that at that they are at risk, immediately at risk. In summary, for PGA North, uh, one of the things that the city did negotiate successfully with Crane on is during our peak delivery months of May through September, we have uh, increased sampling. Uh, we went from quarterly to monthly, and specifically as relates to COG3, we went from monthly to twice a month. With full support, uh, EP, with full city support, EPA is requiring a, a much more aggressive work plan to achieve plume capture. 
Uh, Charles referenced the letters that uh, Mayor Kavanaugh and Mr. Fishbach have written to, uh, uh, to EPA Region 9 as well as the other stakeholders uh, stating that Crane Company needs to be more aggressive in uh, containing the plume and attacking the source pollution at Unit Dynamics. There is uh, EA07 and EA08 extraction wells and six new monitoring wells to be drilled in uh, 20, uh, 2010. Um, Councilmember Sousa, that, that EA07 is the extraction well on 135th and uh, Palm Valley, and that just became fully operational about two weeks ago. So that's the act activity well, you saw there. From what I see here, everything that Crane has done up to this particular point has not restricted the movement of this plume. The, in, in, yes. Mayor, council member, that's exactly right. Every, everything that we've tried in terms of uh, drilling extraction wells and uh, re-injecting to, to contain the plume uh, has not been as successful as it was in PGA South. That's the reason why EPA and ADEQ and the cities have collectively said, what you've shown us to date, um, and I told Charles earlier today, the plume is controlling us, we're not controlling the plume. And, and that has to stop. We, we, we really, uh, uh, Crane Company needs to step up and, and spend the money and employ the technology that's gonna contain the plume. technology they're not employing that can be Used on this? Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, there's new technologies in terms of attacking source pollution at Unit Dynamics that they've just recently um, uh, brought to bear. And, and again, that was due to pressure from EPA. How do we put pressure for them to step up to the plate? We're, uh, uh, Mayor, Council Member, that's, that's what the, um, uh, the letters and, and the joint meetings between uh, the, the cities uh, our technical consultants in, in Liberty Water are trying to do is, is to uh, uh, work with EPA within the confines of the consent decree. One of our challenges, the city of Goodyear was not a party to the consent decree. So, so there's, we're, we're, somewhat at a, we're somewhat disadvantaged because of that. But we, we're doing, I mean, everything from, from, uh, uh, from a management standpoint that we can to, to try to pressure Crane to, to do more. I'm getting the impression they're not as receptive, obviously, as Goodyear was, right? Goodyear Tire? There, there's a different corporate philosophy that's certainly um, uh, the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company seems to have been much more responsive and responsible. Um, you think it's because they're more name recognition than Crane? I, I, that would be. I mean, I would think that that's that, a possibility. I mean, that name it's hard is known to say. all over, but Crane's. So it's not really an issue of that um, the, the north uh, plume is worse than the south. I mean, it's still, it's just a matter of the attacking of it. Uh, Mayor, council member, the, the, the size of the contamination and the uh, concentrations of contamination were much greater at PGA North than they were at PGA South. So obviously it takes a lot more effort to, to clean that up. Fact of the matter is Crane's a billion dollar corporation and, and the expectation is that they will, uh, as I said, spend the money and employ the technology that, that's, uh, that, that responds to the, to the cleanup challenges. Is there still more of them coming down from the unit, unit dynamic site possibly? Because it seems like with the period of time they've been doing it, there hasn't been that much of a change in the levels. Is, is there possibly there's more ground contamination that hasn't been cleaned up that's still seeping down there? Um, Mayor, council member, that's exactly right. That, that's why we need to construct more extraction wells, remediate that groundwater. And the, um, the, the most recent effort is to drill EA07 extraction well, most likely have to drill another EA08 extraction well to the northeast there and then to re-inject water along Dysart Road, north to south, and create a hydrologic barrier to control the plume. Well, I was just wondering if there's more still in the actual soil contamination, how that's been the, taken the, care of, because it seems... Mayor, council member, the, the, the actual pounds of TCE mm -hmm. in the soil and in the groundwater are much greater at PGA North than they are at PGA South. When was this letter uh, sent out from the mayor and the city manager two weeks ago, Crane? 
or two weeks to go through it. Then you haven't had a response to show. What? You got a verbal, didn't you? We, we got an attaboy from the other cities and EPA in terms of the letters. <laughs> but Crane wasn't overly impressed, really. We, we, we haven't heard officially from Crane Company, Mayor. Then if we don't hear from Crane, then what is our next move? <coughs> we, legal? Yes. Well, understanding that our legal options are somewhat limited here. I mean, this is really a federal issue. I mean, we've, we've brought our suit, uh, and that was for the loss of the wells, and we have our settlement agreement, which has some protections for future well loss uh, for us. But as Dave is talking about, really it's in the, in the EPA's court, and it's, you know, I think what we're trying to do right now is make sure EPA is doing the most they can under their consent decree to to make sure that Crane fully performs. So that's really the arena we're working in right now. So the so Fed... The, I'm sorry. So, so the letter that the mayor and the city manager wrote to Crane Company, was a copy of that forwarded to EPA? It, yes. Yes. Yeah. Was? It, it, it was. It was addressed to Catherine Brown, who's the project okay. manager for um, PGA North. Okay. Yes, sir. So, so if Crane went away, would the federal government step up to the plate? One, one of the options, mayor, vice mayor, is for EPA to assume the uh, cleanup activities and then bill Crane. And, and that's, there are provisions for that in the, um, in the consent decree. Uh, there's, there's an informal dispute resolution process that's ongoing that's going to be coming to an end here shortly where EPA, again, pursuant to them trying to turn up the heat, is asking Crane to put, put the additional money to invest the additional money for cleanup. So when they step into it, how long does that extend it? I mean, it seems like everything works so slowly. So if the federal government steps in, the EPA says, okay, we're taking this over and we're going to put the pressure on. Is there a longer time frame than when? It, it, Mayor, Vice Mayor, in my professional judgment, if EPA took over, if EPA was willing to take over project cleanup, then the city would have every right to say, appropriate the money to get the job done. What can we do to get EPA to <laughs> How can we yeah, move we don't wait five more years? How can we move EPA them up? Yeah. As, as, as soon, uh, Mayor and Vice Mayor, as, as soon as this informal dispute resolution process runs its course, if there's no satisfaction, then there is a formal decision that's made by the EPA administrator in San Francisco Region 9 to make that decision. Either mm -hmm. Crane, you step up to the plate and you perform these particular enumerated activities, or then the next option is EPA could assume cleanup. At that point in time, Crane has the ability to say, okay, we accept EPA's uh, decision, or we're going to take this to federal district court and they litigate, and that could take, as you well know, years. The good news is at least in the interim period, Crane would still have a continuing obligation under the consent decree to perform the cleanup activities. We're, we're really at a critical junction now because we need to get plume control. How fast is that plume moving? Approximately 300 feet per year. Well, really, you can't do anything to Crane until legally until we lose another well, right? Well, the city, and, and it gets back to um, what, uh, what Rorick was saying. I didn't touch anything. <laughs> what, what Rorick was saying was uh, uh, our settlement provides for wellhead treatment. For example, if, if our at-risk well, COG3, mm -hmm. reached the maximum contaminant level, that triggers Crane Company to do one of two things, to put wellhead treatment on the well, which would treat that to drinking water standards and keep that water in our system, or in the alternative is the city could request that an alternative well be drilled, equipped, and paid for by Crane. But it would take an, some kind of action and or a happening of losing another well before we could 
legally do anything with Crane. Uh, Mayor, Council Member, one of the things that you'll notice up there in the bullet in terms of a standalone work plan for protection of COG3 is being implemented with EPA's help. Uh, approximately a year ago, the city on our own successfully negotiated a standalone work plan that requires Crane. There are certain trigger points that would require Crane to do things even before the well is contaminated. We insisted upon that okay. because we sure as hell don't want to lose another well, particularly in the middle of July or August, which has happened on previously. You know, somebody on the outside, uh, listening to this tonight might say, are we going to run out of water? Is this going to cause us? You know, is this a danger to our city? And the water resource, I'm just throwing that out because when you talk about closing down wells and a layperson is sitting back there listening to this report, it might be somewhat alarming to them. So maybe you should address that. Vice, uh, thank you, Vice Mayor Lord. Uh, Charles, why don't you address the Adamant Wells that we yeah, bring it online? We, we, have, we have a separate agreement with Adamant Mutual Water Company that allows us to acquire up to 10 million gallons a day of new water from, from their well site. We have a new well that's coming online this September, approximately 1.5 million gallons a day. We have a new well that's being drilled and should be online by this time next summer, roughly a million gallons a day, and we have plans for a third well. So there's a number of well options up there that we're pursuing that allows us to add to our water portfolio. Losing COG3 doesn't help us. You know, we take a step backward in losing that water, but we have new water coming online. Um, ultimately, full development of adamant gives us the 10 million. In addition to the adamant development, we're also uh, looking at options to begin to use our CAP allocation and start to use that as our surface water supply. Mm -hmm. That's a number of years out, but, but that water, you know, at some point is, is going to take the pressure off of our groundwater and off of our well supplies. How far along is the adamant connection? It's, it's done. Done. Okay. So <coughs> are, we re are we taking water from adamant? No. Start that's reserved. Next, next month, September. We'll be starting that well up, putting new water in the system. And that's a big deal for the city. That's the first new well that we've drilled in a number of years. Um, and, and it's the first new water, truly new water and not replacement water for a well that we lost due to contamination. And it's good water. It's very good water, yeah. It's, we, we like to think of it as spring water. You know, it's, uh, salt concentration is only 500. You know, 500 is, is uh, very low for us. Arsenic is lower than we had planned. Um, fluoride and, and nitrates are, are good. There is treatment required, arsenic treatment on that well. We knew that, um, but it's it's good quality well, uh, good quality water, and um, Adamant is is uh, very anxious to continue to help us develop and get new wells online. Charles, thank you. I knew that, but the public, when they're listening to a work session like this, they may not know that, and they could walk away with the impression that we've really got some serious problems. So thank you for reviewing that. You're welcome. On the CAP, I, I thought we were going to have the CAP sooner than what you just said. We have the Indian agreements, mm -hmm. and I thought there was another 7,000 gallons, million gallons per day. There is. That it? was to come online. And I thought 2009 was start. No, the, we, we have. we have it was in 2005 is what we were saying, I'm sure. We have access to the water, but we don't have physical access to that water yet. <coughs> we have the legal right to use it the legal right to access it, but currently no physical means to get it into our system. Is that up there at Beardsley? or? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. When are we going to have that coming down here? It's a question of finances, what it boils down to. And surface water treatment plant is many millions of dollars. Transmission mains, many millions of dollars. You know, so it's, it's tied to growth. It's, it's tied to our economic stability and health, if you will. Well, it's just a public-private partnership, isn't it? We're yes. going to do that on our own. That could be one way of doing it. So we probably, yeah. we probably discussed that a while back when growth was on everybody's mind, and we had to discuss that yeah. at that there, point. There were discussions going on with Arizona Water yeah. and with also with, with uh, <coughs> the county, Maricopa yeah. County, yeah. and uh, a number of, of uh, plans and, and scenarios were, were proposed, none of which came to fruition. And then, of course, the, the economy right. took a nosedive, 
and uh, a lot of things just kind of went into hibernation and on the back shelf. At this point, can we guarantee future residents of Goodyear that they will have a guarantee of 100-year water? Yes. You don't say that loud enough, Charles. Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah. Thanks. And, and he'll be here to prove it, right? <laughs> but, yeah, that's yeah, your job. Yeah. <laughs> Talk to my irises and the tulips. Is this the same it? EPA department that um, is so happy with us or our <coughs> Is this a different division? Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> In conclusion, the, uh, by the way, I'd like to uh, second that, yes. He will be here. <laughs> the fiscal impact for Crane Company between 2000 and 2009, uh, they reported that they spent $54 million on all related cleanup activities. Uh, their available budget for calendar year 2010 is $10.4 million. These, these are the impacts that uh, we've been able to itemize in terms of uh, impacts to the city. Uh, we referenced the uh, 2.1 million gallons a day that we uh, contaminating drinking water supplies, uh, our concern about future contamination and risk to existing production wells, uh, lost development opportunities at the unit dynamics facility, obviously that's, uh, that, that's prime real estate there. Uh, business development, there may be some perceived risks to site development. Uh, property values, uh, on a regular basis I, I get calls from uh, uh, appraisers that, that are interested in knowing about the Superfund sites and, and whether there's any adverse impact on property values. There are not, uh, but, but it's something that uh, we, we get inquiries on uh, with, with some degree of regularity. The fiscal impacts, uh, staff time, uh, legal uh, and, and consulting costs incurred for oversight of both sites runs uh, about $150,000 annually. And then uh, to the city. To the city, that's, that's, uh, th these are um, operation and maintenance costs and consulting fees. Uh, disruptions to the neighborhoods, businesses, and traffic due to well drilling and other Superfund related construction. When you drill these extraction wells, injection wells, monitoring wells, you're putting in uh, delivery systems and treatment systems, there is that disruption with any, any kind of construction. So these are city impacts. Remediated groundwater. Use of remedial groundwater for the city's beneficial use. Remediated groundwater, remember when it's pumped from an injection well and treated, that groundwater is remediated, is essentially free water because it does not require the city to pay any replenishment or withdrawal fees. Uh, the, the only actual cost would be the operating costs of, of delivering that water. But there is no regulatory requirement for replenishment or withdrawal fees. Remediated groundwater is a resource that if included in the city's water portfolio would provide an additional 2.74 million gallons a day currently. That's just with the extraction wells and treatment systems that are in place today. Uh, you may recall back in uh, uh, December and, uh, and January, the city did file its remedial groundwater action plan with the Department of Water Resources. Uh, we are anticipating that that will be approved as part of, uh, part of our designation of assured water supply. We currently have water delivery agreements with both Crane and the Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company for non-potable beneficial reuse for irrigation, dust control, construction, compaction, power generation, industrial cooling, and agricultural production. So what are the next steps? Um, I, th I think Charles alluded to it nicely in terms of potable versus non-potable uses. Tucson, Scottsdale, Payson already use remediated groundwater in their potable systems. Uh, obviously, there's a public perception uh, related to health and safety concerns that would have to be addressed. A lot of education and outreach. Um, uh, make sure that good science and good economics dictate public policy. The remediated groundwater could be used for both potable and non-potable purposes. The PGA South supplies will be available for the next 10 to 12 years until cleanup is completed there and PGA North supplies available for the next 30 to 40 years until cleanup is completed there. So eventually there'll they'll have to be that policy discussion as to putting remediated groundwater into our, our potable system. And as the great late 
William Shakespeare once said, to drink or not to drink, that is the question. We'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Charles, going back to the activities that were occurring at 135th and Palm Valley, okay, when they, put, when they sunk these tanks, really on the golf course property, came across the road, they were taking piping all the way down to 135th and, and Thomas. Why did they do that? Do you know? Part of, part of the well drilling project. Mayor, council member, the, um, the extraction well, the new extraction well there that was drilled on 135th Avenue in Palm Valley, EA07, there is transmission piping six miles to the treatment plant at the community park where the EA06 extraction well and the EA05 extraction well is also going for treatment. Okay. That water is treated and then it is piped back to those injection wells to create that hydrologic barrier. But all that construction activity that you saw was related to the new extraction wells, transmission to the treatment facility, treated water transmitted back, and correct, and, and then back to the injection wells along okay. Dysart. Uh, they, they, they laid six miles of, the only thing Crane did well in the last couple of years is they laid six miles of pipe uh, in, in seven months, thanks to the city's willingness to make easements and rights of way and permitting and doing, they're, they're available. They're doing a very good job in the various repair of the streets that they had to tear up. Well, something's still going on at the school. Yeah, right. I don't right know what that is. Right there yeah. at the school. That, that, that's one of the injection wells, uh, Mayor Council Member, uh, one of the new injection wells that's being constructed at the school. At the school? Yes, ma'am. So, so the choice on this remediated water is it either goes into our water supply for drinking or it goes into the aquifer. Is that right? Are those the or, Mayor, or the third option is to use it for one of the non-potable purposes. Which we do. Yes, sir. Okay. So if we put it in the aquifer someday, we, we will probably yeah, drink it or use it, right? Or, or somebody will for, yeah. for the dam. Yeah. But it's, it's a significant resource. It's, it's a significant amount of water on a daily basis that does have significant value to this community, particularly since our water supplies are so tight. So it's, it's something from a, from a policy standpoint that probably needs to be wrestled with a bit more and determine how far the city really wants to go in the, in the use of that, of that water. I recall years ago when Mr. Nixon was president and he went to a treatment facility and he was offered to, to drink a glass of water from, from this extraction well or whatever it was, you know. It was a sewage plant. Do it. So that's what you're faced with here. Yeah. Remember? Yeah. Did he but drink the, it? Yes. Did he drink it? The wastewater treatment plant? Yeah. Class, yeah. Did you drink it? It's it's oh, very close. It's it's, it's, it's it's very close. It truly is, and the technology is there to do this and mm -hmm. to do this very effectively. That's a plus plus, right? Do you think we'll get anything soon with the home building where they'll stud the house out so that you can use we call it gray water or whatever, we, or use their own water to recycle through and and uh, the the impediment to that is cost. It's it's, it? it's a you're doubling the amount of piping. You're going to have a you're going to have a potable system, and you're going to have a reclaim system, and maybe a gray water system to serve that site. So the amount of money to, to develop the house, to build the house, is going to increase. Too much. And it's, at some point, you know, when, when, when the cost of water is, is is at a point where those kind of, of additional uses start to make sense economically, there'll be more play in that. But it's 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 an economic barrier right now to those kind of things. Any further comments or questions? Been a nice job, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For your attention. Get your act together. Thank you. Thanks. Remember that last quote now. <laughs> to drink, drink or not, or not to, to drink. drink. <laughs> water here? Yeah. Yes. I'm thirsty now. I do need to <laughs> water anymore. <anyway. laughs> um, Thank you, sir. That is the water. Depends Thank on you. how thirsty one will get. <laughs> I'm bringing everybody the um, metal water containers in our next. Yeah, by the way, so we're gonna get rid of this. I figured out it was.
was 1,200 bottles a year that just the 10 of us use. At this I take my home every year. So he's How many times they go around the world? Plastic bottles. It just takes one. Is that another just one? each of us Does one bottle. Oh. <laughs> there's, a, there's an ad. Uh, Okay, we'll now move to the back. last item on our agenda. <laughs> you need BG and, and Joe Schmidt. Sorry, sir. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I do have a presentation. Oh, there it is. Um, as you said, I'm going to talk to you about the Community Development Block Grant Program. First, for just a little bit of background, the CDBG program is a federal block grant administered by HUD, and the purpose is to give communities resources to address community development needs and assist low moderate income persons. And a city can participate in the program in one of two ways, either through the state administered program or the CDBG entitlement program. Currently the city is part of the state administered program, and what that means is Arizona re receives the allocation from HUD. Now, they've designated Maricopa County as an urban county, and so from now on, I'm going to refer to this as the urban county program because that's what the county <laughs> refers to it as. And basically what that means is the state gives Maricopa County its fair share to distribute among the cities that aren't entitlement. They do this through a competitive grant application process each year. As you remember, we bring you grant applications that we're going to take forward to the county. And then they've created an advisory committee known as CDAC, who then makes recommendations to the County Board of Supervisors on what the funding level should be. And Council Member Cavalier is our representative, as well as um, Council Member Osborne, who's our alternate. And it's made up of representatives from all the member cities, as well as the county at large. And there are nine other cities in Maricopa County that are part of this program, which you can see on the slide. Now, the other way to participate in the program is the CDBG Entitlement Community Program. And basically, with that, the city is entitled to receive an annual allocation directly from HUD. To participate in this program, you need to be formally invited by HUD, which the city was in 2008. But we're currently in a three-year agreement with the county to participate in the Urban County Program, and that'll expire June 30th, 2012. And that is the purpose of tonight's discussion is to decide whether or not we should con continue with the urban county program or if we should accept HUD's invitation and become an entitlement status city. And there's several considerations um, we want to think about as we make this decision, including the level of funding we'd receive, the types of programs and projects we could do, the administration of the program, and the home program is another funding source that's related to this entitlement status as well. So with um, the Urban County Program, we've been a part of this for almost 20 years, and we've received $4.6 million in CDBG funds that we've used in the city. And I just want to take a moment to point out that um, since Council Member Cavalier has been our CDAC rep, we've received $2.3 million in CDBG funds, so almost half of $2.2 .2 million. So almost half of our funds have come from Cav Council Member Cavalier's hard work. We've also received 450000 in home funds. And I also need to point out that Councilmember Sousa was a longtime alternate and has been a representative in the past. And Councilmember Osborne is our current alternate. And um, if you've ever been to these meetings, they really have to fight for our funding. And so it's definitely through their hard work that we've received all these funds for the city. Over the last few years, um, these are allocations. We've done a couple of waterline projects, um, the Western Avenue facade rehabs, and the parks improvement project, which we just received funding for and is getting underway. So the average of these wards is $370,000. And you can see they vary depending on the type of project, type of year. Um, we're never entitled or guaranteed to receive an allocation any year. And a lot of times it just depends on that year, the economic climate that year, and who happens to apply. Now, under entitlement, again, we're entitled to an al annual allocation that's guaranteed to the city. Also, what's different is we're allowed to use 20% of those funds for administration, which can include salaries, training, and um, other administrative costs. The allocation is determined by formula, and there's two different formulas HUD can use, and they use whichever one works out better to the particular city. But I just wanted you to see um, up there listed are some of the factors that go into those 
um, formulas, and I think this will tell the story of why our allocation is what it is. And we did talk to HUD staff, and they estimated what they think our allocation would be, and it's estimated at $205,000. And that is quite low, and it's actually would be the lowest of any of the entitlement cities. And at first, it's quite disappointing, but when you think about it, it's a good thing. <laughs> There's a reason why it's so low. It's because HUD thinks that Goodyear is in really good shape and we're doing a great job and we don't need as many funds as other cities to solve our issues because we just don't have them. And so that's the silver lining in our low allocation, of course. So to break that down for you, um, if our allocation was around 200000 we could use about $40,000 for administrative costs, which would leave about $164,000 left for projects. Um, public service program type projects are list limited to 15% of your allocation, and slum and blight projects are limited to 30%, and I'm going to get into what slum and blight means in a second, but public service projects are more things like after school programs, if we wanted to give funding to someone like New Life Center for a program, those usually fall under public service type projects, so that would be limited. So again, another consideration is the types of programs and projects we can do under each program. Now, in general, there's a two-part test to determine if a CDBG project is eligible. First, it needs to meet one of the goals to be eligible, and those are the three goals. But the second part is it also must meet a national objective. So we've done a couple waterline projects, so you can see that that um, is eligible because it helps make a suitable living environment. But then we also have to prove that it meets a national objective. Now normally what you do is you use census data and say the census data, sh census data shows that we have low and moderate income families and so it qualifies. But we actually have very few qualifying census tracts and historic Goodyear doesn't qualify. However, what we've done is um, council adopted a redevelopment area in 2005, and so we're able to do projects in a redevelopment area under that second bullet point, which is prevent slum and blight. And so that's why we've been able to target historic Goodyear through that redevelopment area. Now, um, the problem is that 30, only 30% 30 of your allocation can go to slum and blight talk type projects. That hasn't been a problem for us because we're in the county. So we are, we're never 30% of the county's allocation because they receive a whole big pot of money. But if we became entitlement, this could pose a problem for us because possibly we'd be limited to 30% of our allocation um, using that in areas such as historic Goodyear that don't qualify other way. Now that could change when the 2010 census data comes out, but you know that's just guessing and predicting. The third national objective is urgent need, and that doesn't happen very often. Even Hurricane Katrina didn't create an urgent need. It's, it's rare, very rarely used. Um, so again, under the urban county, um, all those projects that I said were eligible are eligible, as long as they're in a five-year consolidated plan. However, the county has restricted our projects to capital projects for health and safety. And that's mainly because they have a lot of need. There's always double the amount requested than what they have to give, so they have to make a priority. So they say health and safety is going to be our priority. And so we've been following that. However, if we were entitlement, we'd be able to um, basically say what our priorities are. We'd use the public process <coughs> to, to determine where the biggest need is, and our five-year consolidated plan would state that, and that's how we would fund projects. Of course, because of our limited allocation, we might start getting requests from nonprofit agencies, and we'd only have that small amount to possibly give out for projects and programs, so it might not give us the freedom that we hoped it would at this time with a low allocation. And then, of course, pro program administration is another um, consideration. The whole purpose of having an urban county program is to assist cities with administration who might not have the capacity to do it in-house. So the county currently handles our required environmental reviews um, if we have fair housing complaints. IDIS is the um, financial tracking system for the federal government projects. They also take the lead in our five-year consolidated plan, and the CAPER is our annual report. And then they also assist us with our federal requirements. I can call them and get help anytime I need, um, ask questions. But if we became entitlement, basically we'd be responsible for all those things. And I did talk with um, the city of Avondale and Surprise were the last two cities to go through this process of becoming entitlement. And just on that impediments to fair housing, they're each spending $20,000 for consultants to do those plans for them. 
they also each have two staff members running their program. So it can be a lot of work and it doesn't always work out that, well, you have lower allocation so you have less work. It just, there's federal requirements you have to do no matter how much money you get. And then HUD would also audit us directly each year. And then the last consideration is the Home Investment Partnership. Um, this is another HUD block grant, and this is specifically used for housing activities such as um, rehab, home buyer assistance, rental assistance. There is a 25% cash match required for this program, and administrative costs are not eligible. Now, the city of Goodyear has used this um, program for home rehabilitation in the past. We've received 450000 in home funds, and we've used another $2.3 in CDBG funds for this program, but you're not permitted to use CDBG for home rehab anymore since this home program came about. Um, since 1991, we've rehabbed 88 homes, and we're doing another five this year. And we focused our efforts in historic Goodyear and Northern Subdivision. However, I want to note that homes individually qualify, so they don't have to be in a certain neighborhood. So we could open the program up to the entire city. And now that, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. And, and now that you know we have some of these foreclosed homes that people are buying, there might be a need for um, opening it up to the entire city where there might be a need for housing rehab. Would the money that we receive for the home go against the two hundred and four thousand dollars that we were talking about prior to? Um, thank you, Council Member. It would not, and I'm going to get into just a minute what our we would have received if we were part of it, but it would not. Thank you. So under the Irvin County, it, it, it's just like the CDBG program. It's a competitive process. CDAC makes recommendations. Um, the good news is there are funds available. Because of the cash match, not a lot of cities are going for these funds. So if we do want to continue our programs, there is a lot of money available for us to continue the housing rehab program or even going into other avenues such as home buyer assistance. And that's actually a side direction we wanted to get from council. Um, we will be bringing the grant applications to you in November um, for you to make a decision. So we just wanted to get some direction. Should we be looking into the home program? Obviously it won't be till November till you'd have to allocate funds for that, but we just wanted to get a sense on should we be spending our time looking into that or not. I guess that depends on the budget, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's difficult. Because you can end up with, really, too many matching. Um, now, with the entitlement, um, basically, being CDBG entitlement doesn't mean your home entitlement, and Goodyear would not qualify. However, there is the Maricopa County Home Consortium, which is made up of cities who are entitlement but don't qualify for home. And we could join that if we wish. And if we had been a part of it this last year, we would have gotten an additional $65,000. They distribute the funds based on your CDBG allocation. So we would have been required to add $16,000 to that. So we would have been able to get 81000 And that really wouldn't have been enough for about two home rehabilitation if that's how we chose to use that money. So again, we'd be able to get a lot more money in the urban county program with home, but then we also have to upfront more cash. You're not required to be part of the home consortium, so we could become CDBG and entitlement and not participate in home anymore if that's what we chose to do too. So again, just to summarize the options, um, we can stay with the urban county program. If we decide to do that, we'll enter a new three-year agreement. That agreement will come to you this spring to actually um, take action on, and that will run till July 2015. That'll allow us to still get assistance from the county. We might even be able to get more funds through the county, but of course each year those funds are never guaranteed and we also can't use those for administration. Our other option is to go ahead and accept HUD's invitation now to become an entitlement. And however, we would be able to have to administer that program and take on that burden and possibly some costs in getting our program set up. But we would be entitled each year to that allocation and have more freedom in the projects and programs we could do. So that concludes my presentation. Um, as was said in the staff report, staff does recommend that we um, stay in the urban county at this time because of the administrative, administrative burden and the fact that our allocation wouldn't be enough to cover that. Um, it is possible that um, over the next three years, our allocation could change a lot. We're going to have the new census data. HUD is considering changing the formula to consider other factors such as unemployment rates, and that might bump our allocation in the next three years so we could. So we could change our mind later in the next couple of years. 
Um, thank you, Council Member Cavalier. We can change our mind. Once we're in the three-year agreement, we can't break that. Right. We're, we're kind of held for those three years. Within that, after that three years. After that three years. The, the invitation doesn't go away. We're always invited to participate now. So we the can. The five-year plan that we turn in, that doesn't affect the five-year plan. No, it doesn't. And what's the approximate cost of administrator? One person, hundred thousand dollars. In round figures. So. That's all I wanted to hear. <laughs> and you can't use that anyway for match. The matches all have to be cash under that program. For for the HUD. For home, home. there there has it has to be cash. It can't be administrative can't use cost or anything. No. So you've got both and. I've been both a home urban county program participant and a HUD participant, and I strongly encourage you not to go to HUD this year because it, it, it's just not cost effective for $205,000. Judd, is it, the contract starts in 12, correct? Yes. When do we have to make the decision? The county um, wanted to know some direction so they know whether to prepare, but um, we need to take action probably in April of 2011. I know it's almost a year and a half ahead of time, but that's how. We'll have the census information by that point too, won't we? Mm -hmm. we yes, we should. We should by January, February. I mean, I, I tend to agree with you know staff's recommendation, but at least at that point, we'd also have that census information. No, I certainly agree with it because right now Goodyear has pretty good standing with the rest of staff at uh, CDEC, and uh, they're pretty good to us. I'm not sure I understood what we can do with these houses that are throughout our city that are in foreclosure status. Are you saying we can acquire funds uh, and on a match either rehabilitate or acquire those homes? Um, through what program would that be? Thank you, Mayor. What I was suggesting is we do a program similar to what we've done in um, Historic Goodyear and just offer funds to a homeowner to rehab a house they already own. And I was thinking that house might have already previously been foreclosed or due to a layoff. Maybe they didn't have the money to do upgrades that they needed to do um, because of the market. You know this. Or the cabinets are missing because yeah. we bought the house. And cabinets. And that I, I assume that the need for housing rehabilitation is spread among our whole city because of the market and might not just be limited to our oldest part of the city as it was in the past. But how do we uh, identify the, the houses? Though? Well, it has to be an owner-owned house. It can't be a rental house. The owner would make a request. Is that how it would be initiated? No. Apply. That's how it works now. But we can do other programs. We could do home buyer assistance and help people with sure. a down payment to purchase a home in Goodyear. We could do rental assistance um, to help people rent units in the city of Goodyear. We could open the HOPE program to other things that we haven't done in the past. But that has, requires a match. That requires a match. Yes. That requires a cash match. A cash match. Cash match. And the, it would be matching federal money? Yes. Federal right. money. Are we up on that program? Do we have someone working that? Or? <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd, I'd say that not necessarily. Uh, Katie works the program very well, but to get into that program would require a lot more intensive staff work. The entitlement mm -hmm. program. Yes. No, I'm not talking about You're talking about home. No, it's the home program. We're in the home program. I'm talking about a different program. Okay, the home program. I'm talking about, I don't know if it's, is it yes. called it's home? home. It's home, using home funds for other things, such as That's what home buyer assistance. Yeah. You can do that whether you're um, part of the urban county or entitlement. Right. You can use it for any housing activities. I think the city manager was correct that doing something new will take some more staff resources to learn a new program and administer so a new we program. Are, we are capable of doing that one at this point. I don't think so. That was the one you said was um, we could have received 85000 but it would have cost us 12000 up front. That was the home, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. yeah. And it would only been really like two homes that would have been. Yeah. I think the major impediment <coughs> is just the current financial situation for making the match. We could probably do a few more things, but we'd have to come up with the match. 
Well, the match isn't that much. How many homes do we have in foreclosure in Goodyear? Oh, my goodness. We had a report so on that. I don't know currently. 1,200? It was. I don't know what it is right now. Six months ago, wasn't it? That was a while back. I don't think it's that We can get that information and let you know. But we, we have uh, online access now. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, if, if we could determine which, what percentage of our homes are in what we would call distressed sale conditions <coughs> this time, i.e. foreclosed, REO, short sale, I, I think it would give us a better idea on how to do other things around here. Because I, I'm surmising that the number is higher than we expect. And it was than the 12? Definitely higher than it was, I think, but... Higher than 1,200? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Well, with as many that may have been absorbed, <coughs> I don't know, it'll be, I'd be interested in hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Does that break it down per neighborhood so we know, like... Yes. It did the last time, yeah. It did. Mm -hmm. Can you get that? Anything else? Sure. Yes. No, I I think uh, Katie's doing a great job with this, and and uh, it's uh, so far we're doing very well. We're coming out, I think, more positive than if we were in entitlement city. So I think this is a good direction to go. I would recommend that we stay in this direction. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Okay, any comments from council on current events? I understand the city manager has a couple items about the Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'd like to discuss two things this evening. One is the sales tax report, and the second is the calendar, which is before you on green paper. Uh, first, on the sales tax report, um, this slide shows the total tax collections for fiscal year 9 and 10, uh, July 1, 2009 to June 30, 2010. We collected a total of $30.8 million, which is approximately $1.4 million below the original estimate or the budget, and that's 4.4%. However, you'll recall that we did revise the estimates in December of 2009 downwards to $30.5 million, and that was a downward projection of $1.7 million, or 5.5% decrease. So we ended up the year $250,000 above the revised estimate, or roughly 0.8%. Quick question, John. Yes. When that revised estimate went into place in December, uh, from 32.2 to 30.5, did you also revise the expenditures downward to accommodate that, or? Uh, Mr. Uh, Councilmember Pazillo, we have been downsizing the estimates as much as possible. Constantly, yes. Okay. Well, the only thing I'm, I'm thinking about there is if we revise the estimates at 3005 at that point, hopefully the expenditure side would would have you know kind of been tweaked at the, as well because if that was the estimate, then Co coincidentally, yes, we have. Okay. And yes, the numbers I just was looking at numbers today. They uh, they'll be you'll be getting a report in the near future. The expenses are reduced sufficiently to cover the losses. Okay. That will be a report on the end of year yes expenditures and everything yes good this is uh, for fiscal year 10 and 11 and you'll see that the chart uh, shows one month of collections and that's July data which is June receipts uh, this chart shows July collections which is the green bars there's two bars with one with this 0.05% increase and one without the 0.05% increase. The other bars are years back to 2007. Draw your attention to the portion in the circle. The July 2009 comparison to July 2010. Sales taxes were up 16.03% with the 0.5% increase and they were down 0.71% without the 0.5% increase. This is total sales taxes. If we start breaking down the total now into subcomponents, here we have non-construction sales taxes. Again, I draw your attention to the portion in the circle. 
and that's with the 0.5% increase, there was a 31% increase, 31.52% increase from last July. Without the 0.5% increase, there was still a 9.23% jump in collections. Retail sales taxes actually did pretty well this past month. Um, again, draw your attention to the circled area. That's with the 0.5% increase, we were up 39.43%. And without the 0.5% increase, we were still up 11.55%. And that's for retail sales. Hotel is not as pretty. As you can see here, again, drawing your attention to the circle, with the 0.5% increase, collections were down 22.95% from last July. That's with the 0.5% increase. Without the 0.5% increase, collections were down 30.66% from last July. I don't know if there's a, a non-report in here or not, but we'll find out this next month as we get the numbers. Restaurant and bar sales taxes. This, there's just one bar here, draw your attention to the circle again, uh, because the 0.5% increase did not apply to this category. But the chart shows total restaurant and bar sales tax collections for July, and they were up 10.53% from last July. This is the big one, and this is why the total sales taxes are still down a little bit, 0.71%. But again, drawing your attention to the circle, the total collections were down 30% compared to last July. That said, however, the total collections for July 2010 were 57% above our budget, which is up $144,000 over the budget. Uh, so although collections are down compared to last year, we are still hitting budget right now because the budget was just $250,000 per month. And we were at 1 .2, uh, 2007 at $2.7 million in one month. In summary, uh, the sales taxes, the total sales taxes are up 16.03%. Non-construction sales taxes are up 31.52%. Retail sales taxes are up 39.43%. Hotel sales taxes are down 22.95%. Restaurant and bar sales up 10.53%. And the construction sales taxes down 30.68%. Importantly, noting under the retail sales taxes, we did an analysis of the top 20 largest uh, payers of the retail sales tax, and of those, they were up 8.79% without the 0.5% increase. So retail had a good month last month. We were looking at this from the standpoint, was there somebody who paid that didn't pay yeah. the year before? Um, it's basically just a good year or good month, and one of the important things is for people to shop Goodyear because that's reflected right here that that means additional dollars to the city of Goodyear. Any questions on that? What is the percentage of the budget, did you say, John, right now? Budgeted July uh, revenue versus uh, actuals? Don't know for uh, I, no, I mean, you're, you're budgeted. You were, you were talking about uh, uh, comparing uh, prior year's historical actuals, but whatever the budgeted amount for July, where, what was that? Are, are we on track? Are we above? Oh, uh, we're above, yes. We're above? Okay. Yes. I don't recall the specific numbers, uh, Council Member Pazillo. I'll have to get those for you, but we are ahead of budget. Okay. I remember a while back there was a, a report, and I think we had talked about this, which, which took a look. Uh, sales tax is always nice to look at, but from a general fund standpoint, there's a lot of components to it. You know, you have the billing permit fees, you, you know, you have a variety of other sources of revenue sharing. Unfortunately, that doesn't come in as steady. 
But I know there's a report once that I had it was really nice that broke down all the major categories as it, ta as it tied into the general fund operating revenue and looked at the entire picture at a very high level to see where we were budgeted versus actuals. And I know one month it's kind of difficult because these things don't come in all monthly. But I think from a quarterly standpoint, a picture like that would be very helpful just looking at overall because you could have one area up, another area down, one area up. And it's really always interested in the general fund operating revenue overall just to see how our budget is, ver is doing versus the actual. We will do that, Council Member Pizzillo, on a quarterly basis. Okay, thank you. I know that building permits are down significantly, yeah. again, even below budget. Yeah, and that's what kind of is helpful when you see that entire picture, so thanks. Um, if that's any questions or additional time, oh, on the calendar, which is on the green paper, uh, this is just a calendar of the council work sessions that are coming up. Uh, and I just wanted to ask you, I've sent this out electronically before, uh, but in order to review it for the public, uh, we don't have it on the screen, but this is uh, the work session on uh, July. On September 13th is going to be debt refinancing. We'll spend about an hour on that. In 920, we're going to have work session on the ballpark update. We're going to spend about 90 minutes on that. We'll overview sponsorship and event activities, recommendation related to sale of naming rights, recommendation related to season ticket seat sponsorships at the ballpark, and a summary of expenditures. Then we'll also have a work session on emergency preparedness. Uh, that will take about 30 minutes. And the um, we'll have a briefing on the emergency operating plan. And then we'll also have a discussion of the fireworks model ordinance as you'll recall, the legislature passed this year a new statute saying that uh, fireworks are legal in the state of Arizona. Most of the cities in the valley, in all of Arizona, are working with the league to come up with a proposed ordinance, and we will seek co policy direction from you with regards to that. Uh, on 10-4 right now, we have a work session with the GPEC uh, for about 30 minutes. Uh, on the GPEC activities. And then 1018 is the first retreat. We have tried to isolate these to Monday nights so that we can ease the uh, impact on your calendars. And we'll have them start at 4. And on this particular night, we will have financial reporting. We'll discuss for about an hour. And we'll look at overview of proposed changes to the financial reporting to the council and then direction from council on desired reports. And then the rest of the discussion, about two hours, we'll be discussing the 140-acre city center site, such things as the city center phase one design review, uh, the value engineering items that were taken out, the design architectural elements, recruitment strategy for private development on the 40-acre site, uh, Follow-up discussion on the University Park Master Plan update, a proposal from Rob Lankford uh, that we had brought to you before the break, and you had decided at that time not to move forward without further discussion, and policy direction from the Council regarding the next steps related to the Master Plan update, and policy, policy direction from the Council regarding the next step related to universities and an RFI with or without uh, a master plan update and financial assistance and terms to offer. Uh, we want to explore those with you. On the 25th of October, there's a work session on the development review process for about 30 minutes. We'll review the activities, overview the activities related to the process improvement for permits, inspections, and customer service, and then the action plan that we're pursuing for uh, constant improvements. And then we'll have about a 30-minute presentation on pavement inventory, which is the pavement inventory and maintenance overview. Then on uh, November 8th, we will have the first quarter financial update uh, for you, and we'll probably spend about 45 minutes on that. And that's from July till September of 010, revenues and expenditures. And then on the 15th, this is a change from one that you got earlier 
we had a November 1st, but there was um, a, one or more members of the council that couldn't make that date. So in this particular uh, time for the retreat, we are looking at the revenues and taxes, uh, the different uh, sales taxes that we have, the 2.5% sales tax, the restaurant sales tax, the hotel, the construction, and the food tax. We're looking at uh, what might the city be able to look at as far as making any adjustments to those taxes. We have developed, we are developing right now a dashboard where we can electronically have on the screen, we hope, uh, numbers that will uh, automatically change if we put in less of a percent. If we say, well, let's, what if we cut the tax to 2.25% from 2.5%? You put that number in and it will automatically change the numbers on the spreadsheet. And we're also going to be discussing a floating property tax rate and a maximized property uh, primary tax rate. And we're looking for policy direction from the council related to tax policy and structure, including directions related to reductions to reduce the structural deficit and other discussions. This is kind of kicking off the budget exercise. Uh, that's what we have planned in the next few months. Wanted to review that for you uh, so that, again, you could make any suggested changes, additions, deletions, or whatever. Just to know how early we'll be going down to Mobile because that's at 4 o'clock. So. Uh, we haven't made those arrangements yet, but probably uh, I will leave it two-ish okay. so we can carpool down for those who want to. I know that uh, Jim is going to go down uh, from someplace else, is that what I was told? So. Mobile, the night of Mobile. Mobile. On the I thought that was the first Mobile trip that I was planning to do. Yeah. Oh, you Okay. Longer? I don't know. Oh, so, well, I'll be offering a car. Here, I think. Okay. You know, we'll just take a couple cars. Yeah. And I'll be offering that to you. So we'll probably leave it for 3, 2, 3.30. Pardon me? Stand right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. Okay. Please adjourn. Thank you.